ABA Criminal Justice Section Fall Institute. Our theme this year, I think, is a very appropriate theme, and that's criminal justice next. Solutions to move equity and fairness forward. As all of you know, the last few years have been a time of turmoil, whether it's the pandemic, the racial reckoning, or the continued uh, conversations we have about equality and fairness within the criminal justice system. We are at a particular moment in time. We have an opportunity to make substantive change as we move forward. That's what today is all about, to have those conversations, to make plans for the future, and then hopefully to execute them. I'm excited to be here with you today because I know that the people that are in this room are eager and willing to work towards a better future for our criminal justice system. Many people don't want to even say those words, criminal justice system, because of the failings of our system. The word justice seems to be almost misplaced. That's where you come in. That's where we all come in. We have the opportunity to make this system just and to restore that word where we can be excited and proud of the things that we do to not only make people's lives safer, but to make people's experiences in the system fairer. I am proud to be here as chair of the criminal justice system uh, uh, section uh, to talk about the criminal justice system. It's sort of a tongue twister there. Um, as I, I mean, I should have introduced myself. My name is Justin Bingham. I am the chair of the criminal justice uh, section this year. Now I'm stuck. And I'm coming to you from Spokane, Washington, a small, middle-sized city in the uh, sort of interior west coast. We're in between almost everything. Um, but one of those uh, reasons that it's sort of great to come from Spokane is that you have to go everywhere to see and to experience. So that's the, the fun thing to come for me, is to see so many different things that maybe I don't get to see at home. And I think that's a lot of the reason that you are in this room today, that you are going to be able to hear and to listen, experience ideas and conversations from people from across this country, and to hopefully take those ideas back home so that you can do big change in your local jurisdictions. We have sort of a star-studded uh, group today, and we don't really wait around before the stars get on the stage here. Uh, first person up today is our morning keynote speaker, and I will tell you, when it comes to keynotes and stars, it's hard to say that Kim Fox doesn't check all those boxes. As I just told her, and I've told many people before, the reason that I love Kim is the fact that she can articulate the things that I'm thinking in my head. She can put together programs and change that I can only sort of dream about. Uh, we're lucky not to just have Kim here to speak with us today, but she is also one of you. Kim not only is a member of this section, she is one of the people that does the hard work of the section. When our standards director, Linda Britton, contacted Kim to ask if she would be willing to assist as a member of the ABA Standards Committee, Linda told me that she assumed that Kim would find someone within her office to fill that role. But what did she do? She did it herself. The hard, everyday lift of working to create standards. One of the quintessential things that makes the ABA the ABA, the leader in the American legal world. Kim is amazing because she doesn't just lead, she works. 
Kim is the first African-American woman to lead the Cook County State's Attorney's Office, which is the country's second largest prosecutor's office. She was elected for her second term in November 2020, and her vision is to build the most just, equitable, and transparent prosecutor's office in the country by working proactively to make all communities safe while investing in policies to address the underlying drivers of contact with the criminal justice system. That's essentially what we're going to be talking about today, the things that Kim has put to work in her office. And I felt like there was no better person to start off this conversation than Kim Fox. And thankfully, within about five seconds of me asking, she's like, sure, what day do I need to be there? And that was that. Uh, she is literally one of my favorite people within the prosecutor community. And we are lucky to have her here today to start our conference and to build for the hopefully the momentum to create criminal justice next. So Kim Fox. Justin, and thank you, ABA, for having me. Um, it is truly, when Justin extended the invitation to come, uh, it was without hesitation uh, that I would join you here this morning. Um, quick point of clarification, when Linda did invite me to join the Standards Committee, I didn't know I could put somebody else um, on the committee <laughs> uh, to do the work. Um, but it really and truly has been a joy uh, to be a part of the committee largely from what it is that I learned from the various committee members um, and their expertise, knowledge, and passion um, that goes into uh, creating and revising the standards. So it is truly an honor to be here this morning. Um, and it is, it feels like old home week, just getting a cup of coffee. I've seen many um, friends and colleagues that I've met throughout my career um, here today, and I am confident uh, that today's meetings and convenings will lead to what we know will be continued change in our criminal legal system, um, one that will inspire confidence in the legitimacy and the credibility of the work that we seek to do. So I asked Justin, what do you want me to talk about? Because if you know me, I can just go. Um, because there's so many things that we could address. And largely it is around who, who are we, where are we now? in what has been a life-altering period, not just in our country, in our world, um, but in the criminal justice or legal system. So I just wanna take you back for a moment uh, to March of 2020. One week before my primary re-election, uh, I was home with my husband who was watching or preparing to watch a basketball game and was suddenly screaming that basketball had been canceled that evening. And he says, Kim, I think things are really bad um, because the NBA does not want to lose out on a dime and they're shutting down basketball for the foreseeable future. Now as the lead prosecutor of the second largest prosecutor's office in the country, there was something really profound about this moment waiting for a basketball game that would never be was that there had not been a conversation within the second largest prosecutor's office or the largest unified court system in the world about what would happen with this impending thing that we knew nothing about. So that following day, Thursday, we went to work, called a few people, and met with my staff in various offices to assure them that we would get hand sanitizer, to ensure them that we would have soap in the dispensaries, because again, these are the things that we are thinking about in a large governmental organization. Do we have enough soap and paper towels? <laughs> By four o'clock, I'd received word that the courts would shut down on Monday. Mm -hmm. The largest unified court system in the world, the second largest prosecutor's office in the world, my number one priority had been making sure that we had paper towels, was now going to grind to a halt. And what it meant was not just that for our workers or the people who, who work for us, 
not coming into the office, but the people whose cases had been lingering in our justice system for years now being told that they too would have to wait. What then happened is that Friday, this office that it largely managed by paper were being told to go home and wait it out. And not many of them had laptops or technology to be able to zoom in. Zoom was not in our language at all. Um, many of our younger assistants had not had the benefit of watching the Jetsons like I did and <laughs> say that the moment has finally come. <laughs> and there was fear and trepidation. And I had to be reelected that following Tuesday. And what then subsequently happened, I won my reelection. Our staff were at home, people were at home. The fear and anxiety of this new emerging ailment that was yet to be foreseen, the devastating impact that it would have on all of our communities, was a justice system that was now going to be faced with a reckoning unlike anything we had prepared for or anything that we had even in the slightest idea would be as transformative as it could have and would be. We went from having our prosecutors, who are some of the best and brightest lawyers in the country, who would go into courtrooms every day with our victim witness assistants, our investigators, by their sides, holding the hands of those who have been impacted by crime and violence, now being isolated at home. We had our prosecutors who were handling some of the most horrific cases of sexual assault, having to go through discovery at home and teaching first grade math. We had our prosecutors teaching first grade math and looking at horrific pictures and not being able to talk to colleagues nearby. It was and will be something that we study for years to come about the impact, not just the COVID had on the system, but the system holders. And the responsibility that we have as a whole of, of, of gatekeepers of our criminal justice system of thinking about the humanity, not just of the people who use the system, but the people who work within the system, the humanity was on full display. Two weeks later, as we're still trying to figure it out and it became evident that we were not going to open the doors in any time soon, the magnitude of what was coming towards us with COVID-19 was manifesting itself in the Cook County Jail, the largest single site jail in the country. And what we saw was that there were people who were coming into our jail system with this new and novel disease, who were then spreading it in what we were learning very, very quickly was that congregate settings was where this disease would take hold. And then there was no greater congregate setting in which we were unprepared for this disease and what would happen than our jail system. And reckoning number one needed to happen. Are we using the jails in a way that is advancing safety? And when we say safety, we weren't just talking about public safety but the health and safety and welfare of everyone who's in it. Now conversations around bail reform, conversations about the use of jails and over incarceration had been happening for years. It had now come time for us to decide who we were and what we were about. We had people literally facing the potential of death who had not been convicted of a crime sitting in our jails pre-trial because of the system that we'd always had, this is what we'd always done, and now it was becoming a matter of life or death. And in those first few weeks, as we started to see the rise of COVID cases in our jails, myself, the public defender, the chief judge, probation, the clerk's office, all came together in what really felt like an unprecedented show of force and collaboration to start to identify what we could do to diminish the jail population safely while keeping our communities safe and making sure that the health, safety, and welfare of all those who came in contact with the jail was a top priority. And in the course of the first six weeks, we were able to reduce the jail population by nearly 40% in six weeks. 
What does that tell you? It had always been possible. It had always been possible. And as we were reducing the jail population, as priorities were changing in law enforcement of who was going to be stopped, who was going to be arrested, because again, it all became a matter of life or death. Am I gonna stop this person on the street who's smoking marijuana outside of their home? Is it worth the contact that we had? We saw arrests start to plummet, particularly around incidents um, that probably shouldn't have been in our system in the first place. We saw a total change in the trajectory of how we were using limited public safety resources in the wake of this disease, and the sky didn't fall. We always had the power. We always had the priorities. The question was, where was the will? As we were doing this, in the periphery as parents and prosecutors and victim witness and investigators were still getting new laptops delivered to them, and we're still trying to figure out trigonometry for their juniors. That was just me, I guess. Um, <laughs> and managing the mental health and care of my children who were suffering through this pandemic. In the periphery on the news, I heard the stories of Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Arbor. And then the other reckoning, the murder before our eyes of George Floyd. Still in isolation, still separated from the community that we, are, we thrive in to do this work, we saw on our TV screens the murder of a man at the hands of law enforcement. And I, as a leader of the second largest prosecutor's office in the country, with a substantial number of attorneys of color, knew that I too was now going to be dealing with not just the prioritization of our resources, but the faith of the people who do this work to show up every day when they are a part of a system that they believe causes harm. The racial reckoning, as people have called it, is a thing that we do in this country um, regularly. I'm gonna just be honest. And I'm not even that old. I mean, I said the Jetsons, but I'm not that old. Um, <laughs> This is what we do. This is what we do. This is the moment. We now know that we can reduce jail populations safely. We now know that we can prioritize who should have contact with our criminal justice system. We already knew that we had overrepresentations of people of color and poor people in our justice system. We already knew that that overrepresentation was in our jails. We were forced to do something about it. And now we were once again being faced with how are we as system holders going to continue to uphold a system in which people literally were dying at the hands of those who were promised to serve and protect. And the people who were doing this work, who were sitting in isolation, away from their families, struggling with their own mental health and their well-being, were starting to ask themselves the question, is this work for me? Should I continue to do this? And I wish that I could tell you that it was just my young assistants who were asking the question. It really was a moment of reckoning for me. I'd won the primary, but had not yet won the general. And in the wake of George Floyd, and in the wake of trying to figure out how to manage this population during COVID and manage a family and manage a system that felt like every time we took two steps forward, we took four steps back, I really started to, to research my opponent. Maybe he would be a great guy for this job. And then I steeled my spine to realize that the work and what we need to do, particularly in the times of crisis, in two big emerging crises at once, were an opportunity, were an absolute opportunity. And so what we saw in Illinois that I'm incredibly proud of is our state legislator, legislatures, legislators rolled up their sleeves and said, how do we put into practice the things that we're talking about so it's not just performative, but substantive? How do we ensure that our jail populations don't get back to where they were pre-pandemic? And I must sadly tell you that they are back. The rubber band is real short on reform. It didn't actually take two years for it to get back. It took a little less than a year. I should also point out that in all of this, with what we already know, I'm so grateful that election season everywhere but Georgia um, 
is ending. <laughs> Bless your hearts if you're from Georgia. Because every time I would go to a, a different city, when I come to DC and I turn on the news, I am inundated with how awful crime is. Whatever city. And sometimes it would be a bit re refreshing, because I'm from Chicago. And let the world tell it, we are the worst. But I promise you, no, DC, LA, San Francisco. Um, wherever city I went to, the conversations about crime and violence, the politicalization of crime and violence was at pitch perfect. And so for all of the gains that we were making as we started to see, and the reality was that we did start to see more people with access to guns, with shorter fuse, and a rise in violent crime across the country. Not just in large urban areas, not simply in places with progressive prosecutors, but everywhere. And what we saw in this push for a criminal justice system that was fair, just, equitable, that recognized the racial disparities, that recognized the over-policing and over-prosecution of certain communities, and what seemed like a universal agreement that we must do better, met with the tide of rising crime. And the instinct that we have as a country and as institutions to do the thing that makes us feel better to be tougher, despite the fact that the toughness didn't get us the safety that we had promised. In Illinois, our legislators said we wanted to abolish cash bail. And they worked diligently and passed a bill last year that goes into effect January 1st, where Illinois will be the first state to legislatively abolish cash bail. You can clap for that. <laughs> As a prosecutor, I'm very proud of that. I can also tell you I take them, <laughs> they beat me up for that. But it's the recognition that we all know. We all know that in this time of time of tension, time of struggle, what are we going to do to not find ourselves where we were at the height of the pandemic, where we had people in our jail that we could easily let go, but we knew they were there because they couldn't afford it. It shouldn't take crisis and death to do the right thing. And in this moment of opportunity, this legislation has come forth that I believe will make us a more fair and just and equitable system. It's the point. In the course of this, work around police certification and about transparency and accountability, legislation that came forth in the wake of all of these things that we have seen were produced and Illinois has been a leader in advancing such reform. But it doesn't come without a cost. Because as we do this, as there's this understanding, as there's this universal sense that we know what we have to do as crime rises, as the status quo gets discombobulated, the country does what it does. You shrink back. And I see colleagues like mine across the country who are somehow blamed for things for which they have no control. I would be remiss if I did not name the list of my colleagues who have found themselves in the course of the last two years who have been pioneering and trying as hard as they can to bend the arc of justice as prosecutors, a role that generally people don't pay that much attention to, but somehow there's a rock star band of folks <laughs> who need to have laws changed and bended and democracy upended to stop the forward progression. Whether that's Chase Boudin in San Francisco with the recall election that is not, there was nothing more than a subversion of our democratic process or Andrew Warren out of Tampa Bay, who Governor DeSantis unilaterally removed him from his position. Or two days ago, Larry Krasner in Philadelphia, who was impeached by the state legislature. And I'm not saying you have to agree with the policies of, the, of, of my colleagues who have done this work at all. But I think we could all agree that the processes by which um, one disagrees with an elected official generally happens every four years. And the circumventing of our democratic processes to stop those who are trying to do the thing that this conference today is about, 
should be something that chills all of our spines. There are legislation, I talk about the Safety Act, that's what we call our legislation here in Illinois, that will end cash bail and promote transparency and accountability around law enforcement. But there was also legislation that was proposed that would allow for the recall of a prosecutor in a jurisdiction in Illinois in a county of more than one million people. <laughs> for those of you who are not in Illinois, <laughs> it's me. <laughs> it's just me. But legislation like that has popped up in places like Georgia, where we've seen progressive prosecutors in Georgia trying to take up the mantle on some of these issues. Legislation like this in Texas, or legislation that says the Attorney General can step in. All of these new rules to change what's happening. And near two years after we stood what felt like in solidarity, after the death of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and Amanda Arbor. America is nothing if not consistent. And so what do I say to you all? What is Justin thinking that I'm supposed to translate to you all? That the urgency of now is here. That the rhetoric around justice and reform and the folks who don't want to say the criminal justice system, we do not admonish the change of the semantics because semantics actually matter. That it feels unjust that we have institutions that knowingly do things that don't make us safer in the interest of doing the things that get us elected. It is not enough to simply know that we have large incarceration rates and disproportionate incarceration rates of poor and communities of color and simply say that we have inherited a system and that this is what we have and we can only fight for incremental change. That is a lie. As we saw in the first few weeks of this pandemic, when confronted with the opportunity, we can do big, hard things. The challenge to all of you is to sustain that effort. I started with the fact that we didn't have computers. We still used carbon paper in Cook County. Just put it down. <laughs> this year, all of our assistants have laptops at home. We've been able to manage and reduce the backlog of cases after two years. These dedicated staff members who are doing double duty as nurse practitioners at home, teachers, spouses, parents, children, have continued to find a way to do the work in the midst of what has been called the great resignation and it is understandable why folks are leaving the field. I, like many of my colleagues across the country, are struggling to make sure that we can maintain our staff because we are asking them to put justice on their shoulders. And under the most extraordinarily, extraordinary circumstances, they're doing it with the scrutiny unlike anything that they've ever seen. But they are burning out. They are wearing out. But there is a new generation of lawyers who are coming into the profession. And they see this system far differently than I did some 25 years ago when I joined the bar. The expectation of equity is basic. It's not a novel concept to them. They want to know your mission, vision, and values. They want to know your efforts to ensure that your policies don't have disproportionate impacts. They want you to be able to not just know buzzwords, but live them in practice. They are eager. They are hungry. They have seen and marched in ways that many of us had come, become complacent about. And so this section and the work that you are doing that is calling out what have we done in the past that we can no longer do? What is the innovation that stands with us? How do we as lawyers push forward knowing better and in fact doing better? That the innovations that are available at our fingertips, so much innovation has occurred in the last two years because we had to. The question is, how do we sustain it? And so I'll end with this. 
In the last two years, I've lost hundreds of assistant state's attorneys who have lost some mobility in your shoulders for trying to hold this up. And I've seen public defenders leave as well. That this moment of opportunity is not one for us to simply lament what happened, how do we go back to where we were. We will never go back to where we were. And I want to congratulate us because it's a good thing that we finally got away from where we used to be. The question is, as you ponder throughout the day, is how far will we go? How fast will we get there? And who is our coalition that will bring to do it? And I would suggest to you that it is not simply prosecutors or defense attorneys. It's community members who've been impacted by our decisions. It's our partners in law enforcement for whom we have to be credible in our critique and supportive in our solutions and with a sense that years from now, when the next reckoning happens, because it will, that we'll ask ourselves, what did we do when we had the chance to do it? And can we be proud of the legacy that we left? Knowing this August group and what you've already done, I already know the answer, and I can't wait to see it happen. Thank you.